We listen for what the Spirit is saying to the Church today. Let us pray for illumination. Creator God, your Spirit hovers over the earth and breathes life into, thing, into all things. Your creative power is continual and everlasting. Create in us an awareness of your presence. Remind us of your hopes and dreams for our lives. Then motivate us to live out the freedom we find in you. Amen. At Scots Church, our Sunday readings follow a sequence that is shared by churches and denominations throughout the world, what is called a common lectionary. So the reading for today is the same one that will be read in churches throughout the world this Sunday, and it's not especially chosen for baptism. This year, the New Testament readings are mostly taken from the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark is a gospel of action. It does not have a story about the birth of Jesus, but starts with Jesus as an adult, being baptized by John in the Jordan and then going off to spread the message of the coming of the kingdom of God. Jesus is always on the move. Before our reading, he's gone into the wilderness, gone to Galilee, to Capernaum, to a deserted place, to a town in Galilee, to Capernaum again, home, then to the sea, then to Levi's house, to a mountain, and then home again. <sighs> and we're only up to chapter 3. Jesus is clocking up those frequent walker points. Most of the stories Mark tells us at the start of the gospel deal with miracles that are performed by Jesus. Restoring a demon-possessed person in the synagogue, healing a leper, a person with a damaged hand, and so on. His fame is growing. Mark tells us that many people are coming to Jesus to listen to him and to be healed. And in one story, there's such a crowd about Jesus that some people break a hole in the roof to lower a paralyzed man on his stretcher down in front of Jesus. But at the same time, opposition to Jesus is growing. Those with power, both religious and state-based, are unhappy with some of the things Jesus is saying and doing. He represents a threat to the status quo. The scribes and the Herodians begin to take steps to remove him. Our reading for today reflects this opposition to Jesus and shows him neatly sidestepping an allegation made against him. At the same time, it also contains some teaching about the family and discipleship. And it's an example of why some of the teachings of Jesus would have upset people. Our passage is a difficult passage, even for us today. It raises questions about family and also suggests that there is something that is unforgivable by God. I'm not going to deal with all the issues the passage raises. Mark has laid out this little story like a sandwich. On the outside, at the start and the end, there are references to family. On the inside, a dispute with the scribes. Practically, the middle dispute serves to give the family time to reach Jesus. Weaving the sandwich together is the motif of home as the gathering of people of God's community. Thanks, Anne. This gospel, chapter 3, verses 20 to 35. <clears throat> then he went home, and the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. 
Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. <clears throat> and he replied, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. In sacred words of old, we have heard the Spirit speak anew. Let's pray. Grant, O Lord, that these human words may be the word of God for us this day, according to your promise through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. This last week, I finally got round to watching one of the leading movies of 2017, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Last year, it won a raft of major awards, Best Motion Picture, Best Actor, Best Actress, and so on. It is a very confronting movie. It hinges around a murder. The movie is set about nine months after a woman's daughter was murdered in very unpleasant circumstances near a small town in Missouri. Police investigations have made no progress. No charges have been laid. So the mother, Mildred, decides to do something to make sure the murder is not forgotten. She hires three billboards outside the town, hence the title, and puts on them messages questioning the local chief of police for apparent inaction. This causes quite a stir in town. As the movie unfolds, we see how the circumstances develop. We learn, for instance, that the accusation against the chief of police is off the mark. He's a decent bloke who's not trying to cover up for some criminal. And we also watch as the woman's behavior gradually becomes more and more violent. Yet, at the same time, she is the object of sympathy because of her great loss. A variety of people gather around her to support her in her efforts. In the final scene, she sets off with a policeman to kill someone who is undeniably violent, but probably not the actual murderer, a substitute, a scapegoat. As I said, a confronting movie. What has three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri, to do with our gospel reading for today. For one thing, our gospel is also very confronting. Jesus talks about robbing a house. He suggests there is something that is unforgivable. He seems to reject his family. And that doesn't seem like the easygoing, loving Jesus we're used to talking about. Mark himself gives us a clue that we are in for a rough trot in this passage from his gospel. He says that Jesus speaks to the crowd in parables. In the Gospel of Mark, a parable is not a cute story. It's a riddle. It is something that is hard to understand, that appears to be contradictory, and that we have to look at in another way. The riddle starts with those very first words of Jesus. How can Satan cast out Satan? On the surface, the answer is no, of course not. Yet when I reread the passage after watching the movie Three Billboards, with the movie in mind, another possibility sprang to mind. What if Satan does cast out Satan? Actually, before I go further, let me clarify something. I'm not talking about Satan as a bloke with a British accent who wears red tights and has a tail. Rather, I'm regarding the term Satan as referring to something that destroys people and community. This is a bit more like saying, the essence of what Satan does or what the symbol of Satan points to. Back to Satan casting out Satan. Here's how it works from the point of view of the movie. The movie starts with Mildred the mother questioning the failure of the chief of police to make an arrest. In essence, she is saying, 
Bill Willoughby, the chief of police, does not work for justice. And that's like saying, Bill Willoughby is like Satan. He's not good, he's evil. Yet the movie shows that Bill Willoughby is not evil. He's gentle, loving father, working for the best outcome for his people. Mildred's implied accusation is false. It's a vicious and unwarranted attack on the sheriff, even though we know it is made out of deep grief. And what's more, she knows it is unwarranted. One of the characteristics of Satan in the Bible is that of an accuser. Satan stirs up trouble with innuendo and accusations that undermine people. Go look at the book of Job. Mildred is like Satan. So putting this together, in other words, the movie is an example of how Satan attempts to cast out Satan. The riddle in Mark's gospel relies on realizing that the word Satan is used in two different ways in the same sentence. The first usage is that of Satan as an accuser who makes a malicious attack on a person, a false and unwarranted attack, like Mildred. The second usage of Satan is the evaluation that a group or a person places on another. In this case, the person being attacked by the accuser, the sheriff. The group, the community, buys into the accusation and regards the person as bad, even if they are not so. The community stereotypes the person. So we have two usages. The individual doing a destructive thing and the community judging a person as bad. And now here's the surprising thing. This is not just playing word games. In our world, we can see many examples of this process of Satan attempting to cast out Satan. It happens time and again. Here are some examples. And the first one is humorous. We do it when we say something like, Ah, oh, he's a port supporter. As if being a port supporter explains some deficiency in the person's behavior. If you like, you can substitute Richmond or Real Madrid for port. It doesn't matter. In a little silly way, we are making an accusation that generalizes a person as somehow deficient, bad, wrong. More serious example. We see it happen in political debate when a politician slams his or her opponents. Their words stereotype the opposition as bad, bad morally, bad for Australian economy, bad. We often just dismiss this behavior as that's just what politicians do. But it's like that Satan the accuser trying to make another person seem like Satan. But even more serious, this process happens in other issues in our society. Think about the sorts of things that are being said about Muslims at the moment. There's a considerable distrust of this group. Much of what is said or implied about them is negative, that they're somehow bad for society. Now, obviously, such a thing is a false accusation. Not all Muslims are like that. And in fact, I have yet to meet one who is not trustworthy. Yet, we tend to be swayed by this accusation and want to limit Muslims in some way. Satan is a false generalization accusing someone else of being Satan and causing division and disruption. Another serious example might be what is said or implied about refugees or boat people, so-called illegal immigrants although there's nothing illegal about being a refugee in the eyes of the United Nations. They are often presented wrongly as being uniformly bad. And I'm sure you can add other examples from your experience, perhaps even growing up at school in the schoolyard where people picked on people for no good reasons. Why do people do this? What's the payoff? When someone demonizes another person, they're making a point of difference into a division. They're creating a boundary that divides people into an in-group, those who agree with the accuser, and outsiders. In doing this, they create a sense of unity for the in-group. I belong to this group, those outside are bad. 
They get power that way. Oh, another example. Listen to the words of the current President of the United States. He seems to seek unity and power by calling other people bad. Mexicans taking jobs, other countries producing cheap steel, and so on. And so far, it seems to have worked pretty well for him. This sort of behaviour creates and emphasises divisions in society. Rifts form around things like race or income or behaviour. Is being called bogan a compliment or an insult for you? It forms unity for one group at the expense of denigrating and attacking another. The problem is that this unity achieved by calling another person bad is a fragile thing. You have to keep finding someone else to demonise. One day, you might find that you are the one put on the outside. So how can Satan cast out Satan? When one person unjustly accuses another person of being evil in some way. Back to our gospel passage for today. Jesus presents us with a riddle, a riddle that highlights some of the worst of human behaviour, to call something bad when it is not. What does he do about this? In the story in the Gospel, the family of Jesus is coming to meet him. They think he's nuts. They want to restrain him. When Jesus is told that his family is outside at the door, he responds with these words. Who are my mothers and my brothers? Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. At the first sight, this might sound like Jesus is rejecting his family and replacing them with those inside the house with him. But this is not the case. The Gospels make it quite clear that Jesus did not reject his family. No, what Jesus is doing is expanding what it means to be family. He's not drawing a boundary. He's enlarging it. He's erasing a boundary. In fact, the life and ministry of Jesus is characterized by this feature. He did not follow the Sabbath laws which excluded people. He associated with people who were unclean, people who the scribes would keep out of good society. He healed them, accepted them, taught them. Where the society of Jesus had drawn boundaries, Jesus crossed them. The breaking down of divisions is a leading theme in the Gospel of Mark. In fact, the very first incident in the Gospel exemplifies this motif of inclusion. In chapter 1, before Jesus starts his ministry, he's baptized by John in the Jordan River. Mark tells us that as this happened, the heavens were torn open and the Spirit descended. Now, in the ancient worldview, the heavens were what separated God from the world, like layers, earth, heavens, God. To have them torn open meant that the only barrier between God and the world had been breached. To have the Spirit descending indicates that God was present on earth. God had crossed that boundary between heaven and earth and accepted, included all of earth in God's love. Today, we're going to celebrate another baptism. It's not a magic act that somehow gets Parker into heaven. No, it's a symbol, a remembering that Parker is part of something much larger that Parker is loved by God. It's a recognition that Parker is part of a family, the nuclear family with Troy and Victoria, an extended family with godparents, Vernon and Narelle, Matthew and Haley, a family that stretches back in time with a grandmother, Helen, who worshipped at Scott's, a family that includes this congregation who will be making a vow to support Parker, and even more, that vow is made on behalf of the whole Christian community throughout the world. As the baptism we perform here is recognised by many denominations, Catholic, Anglicans and others. Today, we celebrate that Parker is welcomed, not just by the family and friends and the whole church, but also by God. 
In the simple act of baptism, we celebrate not the divisions that separate, but the love that unites the world, the whole world. And what holds for Parker William Fenning holds also for us, all of us. We are accepted and included, whether we be Protestant or Catholic or not too sure, port supporters or bogans or silver tails or whatever. Difference does not divide in the eyes of God. You, we, are all included in God's family, the community of divine love. Amen.